Son. We got a picture you got. Oh, it's just my little projector. Some of you are really good. We'll see what happens. It's the fun of analog. Sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so thank you everybody for, for coming tonight. And uh, it's, it's a real thrill to be here at the TDC and to get to show some of this work and talk to, talk to you about sort of why it exists and, and why it's important for Facebook. Um, as Carol said, my name's Scott. Uh, I'm a graphic designer, printmaker, bunch of other things. Uh, troublemaker being probably the most important one. Um, mostly accidental troublemaking. <laughs> uh, what I think I want to start with here is this, this idea that, uh, from Annie Albers, uh, where she said, modern industry saves us endless labor and drudgery, but it also bars us from taking part in the forming of material and leaves idle our senses of touch and with those formative faculties that are stimulated by it. And what this is really talking about to me and what it means to the analog lab is this idea of getting your hands dirty. You know, Facebook, as you might expect, is a digital company and people spend a lot of time in front of the screen. Uh, I'm very lucky in that I get to spend time in front of a different kind of screen, one that's actually made out of fabric and that actually allows us to print a lot of the work that you see here. Um, and there's something magic about the fact that there is this weird print shop inside a digital tech company. You know, the fact that there's a print shop in and of itself is not really remarkable or necessarily anything special, but I think where it exists and what it brings to that culture is actually what makes it really important. You know, and part of that starts with this idea of just trying to understand ourselves. You know, and I think if you were to look around the room and start to look at the work, you know, I think that's one of the things that will help you try to unpack what some of this stuff is about, is thinking about a different view of the world beyond what you see staring at a piece of glass. So whether you really know anything about the lab, how about we see a show of hands of anybody that does know anything about the analog lab? We got a couple of Facebook employees, so I hope I hope that those guys, uh, those people know know something at least. Um, but it's not unusual to to not have a whole lot of information sort of on what what the lab is or why it exists. Um, you know, and and like I was saying, this this is something that you would think a digital tech company would reject. It's like paper's dead, right? You know, everybody expected ebooks to sort of finally kill the paperback. And I think we all know that that didn't exactly go to plan. You know, digital things are supposed to be better than analog things. In a lot of cases, technically they are, um, but there's an experiential aspect that is often sort of excluded from the equation, and that's really where a lot of this stuff becomes important. Uh, John Maeda said, the speed at which you make something determines the thought process that you will use. You know, and this is very much an important part of how we make the work and why we make the work and what happens during the process of making the work. At every stage, it forces you to slow down. And when you slow down, you actually have a chance to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And this is really, you know, when you talk about a company like Facebook, things, you know, we have this old, old poster that used to say, move fast and break things. We try not to break things anymore. It actually, at some point, got turned into build things. Um, but the idea that if you're moving too fast, you actually, you're kind of going instinctually and you actually don't really have a chance to process what's happening and why you're making the decisions that you are. And so for us, the slowing down aspect of actual printmaking and doing it kind of the hard way is really critically important. You know, and as much as these things are a visual uh, expression or visual medium, they're also kind of an intellectual one. You know, the posters that we make are about sharing ideas not so much about uh, you know, advertising an event, let's say. You know, we do a little bit of that on occasion, but for the most part, the bulk of the work and the stuff that's really the most important to us is the work uh, that is, is about an idea and about encouraging sort of community and, and participation more than anything else. All right, so let's take a little bit of a journey back through the history of the lab just to kind of get you up to speed so you kind of understand how it started and why it started. Um, 
you know, the lab started back in 2010, uh, so next year will be our 10th anniversary, which is kind of amazing considering Facebook just turned 15 on Monday. Um, this is, again, not something you would think that how did this survive for 10 years and actually has grown to the, to the rate it has, and you'll see, see that in a second. Uh, it started in this, this little warehouse space, kind of in the back of Facebook's Palo Alto uh, office on California Avenue. Uh, don't ask me what the dream room is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think I know, really. Um, and it was, it was started by these two guys, Ben and Everett. And they were like me in that they came into Facebook and worked on digital things. You know, I, I started out at Facebook as a communication designer in 2012. Um, and so uh, the dream was like, how do I get my hands into this pie over here that's, that's really exciting and fun? Uh, and luckily enough, I was able to do that eventually. Um, but they, they started doing this because they missed making things that, that were, weren't just based on ones and zeros and pixels and things that would potentially sort of outlive them in a way. Um, a lot of the, you know, pretty much everything I ever made that was digital at Facebook is long gone. There is no real record of it other than anything that has been saved on a hard drive somewhere. Uh, whereas the print work that I've made and that Ben and Everett made kind of during, during their time, like those things still exist. And that's kind of telling in a way, I think. Um, the building that, you know, the place that they started in, in this sort of back room uh, where they didn't ask permission, they didn't tell anybody they were doing it. They mostly did it sort of after hours and on their own with their own money in a lot of cases. Uh, eventually, they managed to, to scratch together a little bit of budget from the company to, to su support what they were doing, but after they'd kind of gone to the work of proving that it was something of value, uh, they'd cobbled this, this original lab together. And so there's a bunch of screen printing equipment. The, the building itself actually was a medical supply company at one point, so they just sort of scrounged tables and cabinets and anything they could they could repurpose to use for the for the lab um, we still even though this building doesn't exist we still have that dark room sign in the in the corner there it actually is a lot dirtier looking now I don't know what quite hap has happened to it over the years but one day it'll get reinstalled somewhere um, even even the old letterpress we had actually just as a fun anecdote was nicknamed old Facebook which makes perfect sense if you really sort of think back to what Facebook has sort of become in terms of a, a sort of newspaper uh, for most people. And the way they did this is something that we describe as the hacker way. You know, and this is really, it's not about hacking as the way that most people would think. It's actually just this, this DIY attitude of like, find a way or make one. In this case, they wanted to do something and they found a way and at the same time kind of made, made a way to create this amazing job for themselves, uh, and ultimately, that I fell into. Um, and like I said, they didn't ask for permission, they just, they just went and did it. You know, these things, uh, in terms of the processes, screen printing and letterpress, made a lot of sense, um, because they didn't need a big capital investment. This is something you could spend, you know, a couple hundred dollars on Amazon and buy a full screen printing kit to start printing something at home. You know, there's no really complicated equipment. It's all stuff you can build. Our original exposure unit was built out of plywood and a piece of glass and a blacklight tube. It was, there was nothing fancy about it. Uh, and you don't even need a lot of space to do this stuff. Like I said, you could screen print on your dining room table at home. Um, but they did require people to do the work. And this is, again, sort of the antithesis of digital in that digital just sort of feels like it does everything for you. Where you know, We have people that will come into the lab even today and say, where is the, the, the printing machine that makes the posters? And we sort of look around and then point at ourselves or point at them and go, like, you're the printing machine. Uh, and that confuses people for a few seconds, and then we go and sort of explain, like, why that is and why it's important. You know, and in, this is Monica Garwood, who's one of our designer in residence, who will get to meet a few people that have gone through the program in a little bit. Um, and what's important about this work is just the, the human quality that comes through it. You know, and I hope you guys will have a chance, to, if you haven't already, to take a close look at some of the prints and you'll see the imperfections in them. You'll see where type has sort of gotten blown out because we didn't move correctly and ended up putting too much pressure on the screen at some point. And so the, the ink actually just pushed through the stencil in kind of an awkward way. Or there's just little 
you know, uh, scratches and, and things that came through from the screen. So it just leaves this residue in these prints that makes them imperfect. And so they just sort of feel more human than something that comes off a digital printer. We've obviously since moved on to also using a risograph printer, which we could spend a whole hour talking about that. Um, but for anybody that doesn't know what it is, it's basically a thing that looks like a copier. Uh, but you print one color at a time through a stencil-based process. It's very similar to screen printing. So any of the small, the really small prints that you'll see kind of up on the wall, there's a bunch back here, um, those are risograph printed. And they're also very kind of imperfect, particularly if you look at the, the, yellow, the one on the yellow sheet there, the registration is all over the place on it. Um, but that's, again, that's part of the beauty. And I think in a digital space, seeing the beauty of something that isn't perfect is actually a really nice counterbalance. And if we look at, you know, to go back to sort of why this is important, a lot of it is just to under, understand ourselves and to have conversations about what's happening inside the company as well as what's happening outside the world and how those two things begin to affect each other. Um, this is me up on a ladder back in 2015, I think. Uh, I should know this, but I don't remember all of a sudden. Um, painting, a, painting a mural inside uh, one of the offices in, in Menlo Park. And it ultimately ended up saying, why aren't we talking about blank? And there was a big, long line that I actually expected people to write on, and they ended up just sticking sticky notes all over it, and it's, it's still there to this day, covered in sticky notes of all of the things that, you know, the conversations that, that maybe aren't happening, and a lot of them are funny, um, but every once in a while there's something that's really poignant um, that somebody asks, and like, why aren't we talking about something, you know? And so, here's the team uh, over the course of the last nine years. So this is everybody that's been in the lab since day one. I think I got everybody. I don't, hopefully, hopefully I'm going to be really embarrassed if I did forget somebody. Um, if we go back to 2012, it's just these two guys. That was it. This was, the lab was their side project. Go a couple years in, uh, ahead and it was a few more guys. You notice that it's all guys. It's printmaking. And then we go a couple more years ahead and we start to get some, some ladies in here, which is nice. And then things change even more. And every time we're getting a little bit bigger. And then we get to today. And so this is currently what, what the Analog Lab team looks like. Um, and we're spread all over the globe, uh, from London to Dublin to Singapore to here in New York to Chicago, Seattle, Austin. What else am I forgetting? Menlo Park. Probably. Did I say Seattle? Anyways. Uh, a whole bunch of different places, and, and this is continuing to grow. You know, so this is a, an ongoing concern, which is actually also you know, kind of interesting and telling about how Facebook values what we're doing. You know, for most people that, that do know anything about the lab, this is the, the work that they most know. So we call these the red type posters. Um, if, you, if you've seen anything, it's something like, what would you do if you weren't afraid, or move fast and uh, build things or break things, depending on which which one you know. Um, this was the earliest work that Ben and Everett were producing. And it was really purposely very simple and rudimentary because of the equipment that they had. You know, printing on one paper with one type, basically one typeface and one ink color it was really simple, really inexpensive, and just made it easy for them to actually produce stuff. Um, the fact that the the screens that they were using were not great, and we didn't have an exposure, a proper exposure unit. They were printing what would normally be a piece of film on a piece of paper, and then taking these really, really long exposures to actually get the screen to, to actually be able to be usable um, meant that they had to keep this pretty simple. And if you kind of know anything about the history of some of this stuff, you know, this is the Colby uh, printing company from out of LA, and like this is a direct reference. Uh, to where some of that work came from. And same with things like this, like old boxing advertisements. You can see, I mean, the typeface that's used in those, those po uh, posters is Champion Featherweight. So from, from local, local friends, the Hoffler Type Foundry. Uh, and so, and this is, this is the inspiration for that. So it's natural sort of uh, connection there. And then also these old sort of war propaganda posters. 
there's just in the tone, I think, more than necessarily the visuals. Um, visually, I think these are obviously a little bit more interesting. You know, and, and this, this work ended up being taken really seriously, and seriously to the point where people would engage with it. You know, they would, they would take the posters and, and, and write on it. And some of these are really not appropriate now that I look at it really closely. Uh, but it, they also would do funny things like I would write on the wall. Um, you know, but at the same time with these, the fact that they were red when everything else was blue helped them stand out. Maybe not help, doesn't help that this is on a red wall, but <laughs> people took notice of these things, obviously, by the fact that they were interacting with them. And this is, this is a day in 2012, actually the, the, my first day in the lab. Um, I managed to dig up this photo with Ben and uh, Keegan, who Brad here knows. Uh, we went into the lab and printed, printed uh, some posters one night and then proceeded to drive around on uh, uh, green machines in the unused warehouse space right beside the lab. Uh, and this is, this is really how it picked up momentum. People would, would sign up to do these demo nights and you know teams or like little groups of people would come in and they would learn how to print and in a lot of cases they would get to help decide what was getting printed. Um, and that's how a lot of those red type posters kind of came about. It was people suggesting a quote that meant something to them um, or finding something that was just happening within the company at the time and those got turned into things. Uh, the process has changed a little bit for how a lot of the work gets made, but that still happens on occasion where somebody will just say something that we know has a particular meaning uh, and would be worthy of being turned into something real. And, Sometimes we also will, will go and sort of edit what they said because, like myself, sometimes people can be a little long-winded. <laughs> you know, and these, these are really great teaching moments, you know, and I think even, even you being here is in some ways a teaching moment of like getting to see like why this stuff exists and what makes it kind of special or important. Um, and the more we get to do this, the more we see really how meaningful it, this stuff can be for people and how the experience of actually being involved in it can be important for people. This is actually last year in, in Dublin at the Offset Conference. We, we trucked our risograph machine, which is, there it is right there behind me, um, from across the street uh, from the Facebook Dublin office. Actually, luckily, just happened to be literally across the street from the venue where this event was held. So we didn't have to hire anybody to, to move it. We just literally rolled it across the street. Um, and, and we were teaching classes here. You know, here I was actually showing people how to hack the risograph. And the risograph has a limitation of printing to, if you're in Europe, an A3 size sheet. If you're over here in America, it's a tabloid or 11 by 17 sheet. But of course, if you think about it, what's to stop you from folding a bigger piece of paper in half and running it through the machine and printing on both sides? Nothing really. And so that's what we were doing there. You know, I think one of the things that is hard to know necessarily from the work just by looking at it, but I think is important to understanding where a lot of this comes from, and I sort of alluded to this a minute ago, but like this work comes from a bottoms up kind of place in the way that the company operates. You know, very, 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 very rarely does a message or an idea for something come from the top down to us and somebody saying, make me something that says this. Uh, there's only a very small handful of instances where that happened. And usually when it does happen, it's something that we were already going to do anyways. Um, we don't take requests. It's sort of what we tell people. You know, we have lots of people come in. It's like, I've got a great idea for something. And most of the time, it's not really that great. Or it's, it needs a lot of work to get it to a point where it's actually something that is a good idea. Um, and what this ends up doing is it's filling a communication void for people. You know, the problem with digital products in a lot of cases is that there's a lot of noise, right? You know, you spend your whole day scrolling through something and you don't necessarily stop to appreciate something or really absorb it in the same way that you can with something that's just sort of patiently there waiting for you. And that's really what a lot of the posters are doing for people is we're taking an idea, elevating it into a physical form, putting it somewhere where they can experience it, you know, by they can touch it, 
They can feel it. They can, if they don't agree with it, they can rip it off the wall if they really want to. Um, that's happened before. Uh, or in, you know, often when they rip it off, it's because they want to take it home. Um, but it's, it's just a way to get these messages to sort of stick a little bit better in some cases or, or for people to react to them in a different way. I think pulling something out of one context and putting it in another can really change the meaning of something, hopefully in a good way. You know, when we look around and everything is accelerating, everything right now. And the more we can do things that sort of encourage people to slow down and, and to think about uh, what's happening and why it's happening and what the effects of what's happening are, that's really what we want to do with this work. Um, it's, you know, it's not about you know, really a propaganda kind of thing. I mean, I suppose be naive to say it's not in its own way, but it, that's not the point. Um, and because it's not coming from the top, it's, it's sort of this weird backwards kind of thing. Uh, I tend to describe it as like introducing positive friction into the workplace. Um, technology is largely about removing friction and making everything kind of speed up. And what we're trying to do with this is actually the opposite of that and get people to, to slow down and be more aware of themselves, of other people, and just what's happening. So if we, I'm going to dive over here to this is sort of the middle years of, of the analog lab. So we're now at somewhere around 2012 to 2015-ish. Uh, and so this is Menlo Park. This is the Facebook office in Menlo Park, all weirdly colored. Uh, and then this is the analog lab now. And so we have this weird little storefront kind of space. All the, the windows are all hand-painted. We have a nice little hand-painted sign out front. Um, and unfortunately, this is not open to the public. One day we will have that, one day. Uh, but uh, for anybody that's lucky enough to somehow make it inside the walls, you get to walk down this sort of Disneyland-like street. And we're one of the first stops on, on the tour most of the time. And people will come in and sort of see what's happening in the lab. As the work you know, as the lab sort of evolved, I think one of the things that really happened with the work itself was this sort of tonal evolution. Um, the red type posters, which like I said, were sort of the beginning, the genesis of the lab, were very direct and pointed. Um, kind of, com they demanded a certain amount of attention and presence and were kind of commanding in a lot of ways. Uh, what we've been doing kind of since then is actually really trying to diversify the type of work that we're making, the type of messaging, the tone of the messaging. You know, I think what the organization has actually needed has changed a lot uh, over the years from, from what they need from us and from what people need from each other uh, within the organization. So reminding people again of, of just how to be empathetic with one another, how to see beyond the walls of the technology world into, you know, New York is a very different place from Menlo Park. So is the middle of South Africa. You know, to be able to start to see and really try to understand and internalize what those places are like and what the people that you know, uh, exist there, uh, what their lives are like will help make everything better in terms of the products. You know, we don't intentionally really talk about the products um, that Facebook makes, but I think inevitably these things are somehow related to it, but never Never overtly. I'm never going to make a poster that says you should read Newsfeed. But I will make one that says Black Lives Matter. Uh, and this is this is again where like I think we skirt the line a little bit sometimes with trying to find where the edges are for what we're what the company will let us get away with making. You know, and luckily this is something where the company has taken a hard stance and says like yes. Uh, and so we've been lucky to be very supportive in, in doing things like this. Uh, you'll get to see there's a really cool uh, picture in one of the books that's over there um, of a very, very large group of people with some of these posters um, that, that was taken one day back in 2016. Uh, it's sort of a bit of a proud moment in a way that uh, like I'm sitting somewhere in the front, for, which I don't know why that happened. Um, 
you know, and this is like I, I don't think I exactly said it, but we've kind of you know, put an end to the, the red type posters. They're not really Facebook necessarily anymore, but this is a case where we sort of brought it out of retirement because it is something that needed to have a strong message. And actually there's a few different versions of this with different colorways. Um, but this is sort of one of the, I guess, official, official ones. You know, and a lot of why we would even get involved in things like that is this sort of idea from, uh, from LCD sound system from, I'm of course blanking on his name now, and I wrote it down earlier. Uh, who's the guy, anybody know? Lead guy from LCD Sound System. I want to say James something. James Murphy. James Murphy, thank you. Uh, yeah, who says the best way to complain is to make things, and like this is, this is what we're doing. We're making things because there's something to take issue with, or there's something that just needs to go out into the world. And I think that's kind of an amazing thing about what designers are capable of doing, and artists equally. So now we move a little bit into 2016. This is a fun little video I made to kind of recap 2016. I've only done it the one year, but this will give you a picture of, I think this is just about everything or everything that was made in the lab by us and our designer residents in 2016. Let's just get a bit faster. A few of these things are on the walls here, which is nice. Ah, nice sunset to wrap up. Courtesy of Alana Schlenker, who's hiding somewhere in the back there. You know, and this is one of those things that uh, we all struggle with. I think ourselves, too, is doubting ourselves. You know, I think it's sort of an, an innate thing in designers. And this is how we get to be our hardest kind of critics of the things that we're making and deciding, you know, what stays and what goes and what, what goes out in the world and what stays in the back of a sketchbook somewhere. Uh, and this is also one of those things that if you get to be a fly on the wall, probably in any organization, you'll see lots of people fighting imposter syndrome. And this is exactly what this poster is about. It's trying to reconcile that with yourself and to understand that you're not alone and that uh, everybody has their moments when they feel the same thing. You know, Jane Goodall said, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you wanna make. And for us, the body of work that we're producing is about trying to be a positive force uh, within this company that you know, can help propel it forward and also make sure that it's being responsible to itself and to the people that it serves in the right way. And to acknowledge the things that we, we know and that we don't know. And just to be a window as well as to all the things that are in front of us that maybe we're not seeing. This is Joseph Alessio who completed a residency last year and actually made this mirrored acrylic uh, laser cut piece. Uh, I wish I thought to actually make a second copy of, because it would have been really cool to actually bring that here. Um, and this is one of those things where, you know, digital tools and analog tools, I think, uh, respectfully, can also be your best friend or your worst enemy. And it's up to you to sort of decide which way you want it to go and how much you want to be involved in it. By the end of 2015, since I'm going to go back a little bit here uh, for a second, we actually, what we needed to do was take a hard look at what we were doing. And we had some like really kind of tough conversations and then decided that we were going to do something kind of crazy. And we weren't really sure how people inside the company were going to react. And we really only did this in Menlo Park, but encouraged some of the other offices to also potentially do it. And we ended up taking a bucket of paint one day in the afternoon, a few of us, and a big roller. And we went and we whitewashed over a lot of the posters that were on the walls. We were talking about taking them down, 
but ended up deciding to just paint over them. It felt like it was actually going to be more dramatic. What we really needed was to kind of clean everything up. Uh, every, you know, the poster work, which is supposed to be more of this sort of focused kind of communication method, actually became really chaotic and uh, messy and needed a clean slate. And so this was our way of encouraging people to really, one, notice that that was the situation, and also to take action and also participate in helping decide of the things that are on the wall, what's important and what's not, and to take down the things that are not important or that don't matter anymore or seem irrelevant for some reason and put back the things that actually do. And that helped inform how we sort of move, have moved forward since, and it actually ended up changing radically how we put work up in, uh, in the offices. And what it also did was helped us find a point when we could kickstart this designer in residence program that started at the beginning of 2016. Uh, in, over the course of the year, we brought in 10, diff 10 designers from a whole bunch of different places here in the States. Um, and they got to come into the lab and work alongside us and work with us and hopefully had a chance to learn something from us. And we definitely had some stuff that we learned from them. And uh, we really wanted to do this to allow us to make more work and put more new stuff out into the world, but at the same time, really diversify what that work was and what it looked like and where it came from. Uh, like I said, it, this is about showing people different sides of the world beyond what they already know. And so this was the best way to do it because the work that these people were gonna make was not the work that I would make. I couldn't do it. Uh, and because of that, probably wouldn't do it. or wouldn't even try and probably shouldn't try. Um, and, and this was, you know, for us, this was really exciting. It was scary as hell because uh, we literally started at the beginning of the year and had no idea what we were doing. And I don't think I've ever had a chance to apologize for anybody, anybody that came through in 2016. If, if we seem disorganized, it's because we were literally making it up as we went. Uh, and ama you know, amazingly, people were really excited to, to come in and, and we were, we're still to this day so thrilled and thankful that they did. Um, and, and this was a good way for us to also give back because when you've got this lab, these, you know, particularly the one in Menlo Park at the time, this thing that is not publicly accessible, you know, this was a way for us to open it up to other people. You know, it's, it's a place to start at least. You know, I think we've, we'd ideally like to do a lot more, but uh, you know, we'll get there eventually, I hope. You know, this is, here's, here's Eddie who's, who's here tonight as well. I found this this afternoon, digging through my, my photo archives. I actually forgot I had this photo. Um, getting messy, and uh, I wish I actually had that print here too. Um, you know, and this is hopefully uh, a very valuable experience for them, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, and hopefully whatever mistakes that got made through all of this process ultimately ended up in something good. You know, we didn't know if it was going to work. Designers don't work like artists. Artists are pretty used to doing a residency kind of thing where it's like, you go in, you've got so much time, go nuts, work on your passion project kind of thing. It's, designers don't tend to work that way. They tend to be like, give me a problem and I'll do something to solve the problem. Um, this was really sort of trying to turn that on its head a little bit. And even to this day, we're still experimenting with like what works, and it becomes a little bit different uh, each time somebody new comes in. This is uh, Frances McLeod and her finished installation that she did here in our uh, New York, one of our New York offices. Um, you can see some of the pieces that actually went into this work over in some of the zines that are that are over on the shelf there. You know, and as we have gotten bigger, the team's expanded, We're, we now have analog labs in nine or 10 different offices now around the world. We've had the chance to actually bring in more people and we're gonna continue to do this. Uh, and this has been really exciting, rewarding. It's great to have the ability to do this here in New York. Uh, and so we're constantly on the lookout for finding the right people to bring into this. Unfortunately, we can't do an application process. It's only sort of invitation, but uh, we're always looking for recommendations and things like that because you can only do so much with Google. So what I'd like to do now is uh, have a bit of a change of pace and 
bring up these lovely people here, and uh, we'll have a little chat about the program. Does anybody need a water, water break, bathroom break? Any kind of break? You're just tired of me rambling on. <laughs> All right, well, without further ado then, have you guys introduce yourselves. Is that good? And tell us a little bit about what you do, who you are, what you do, where you're from. Okay, uh, uh, my name is Ilana Schlenker, I'm a graphic designer. I participated in the Designer in Residence program in 2016. Um, I run my own design studio called Studio Ilana Schlenker. I just launched uh, another studio called Out of Office um, with my partner, Mark Bernice and uh, I publish gratuitous type, so that's okay. Hi, um, I'm Kay Blagvad. I'm an illustrator and I make a, um, I have a line of products and jewelry and things that I make um, and also work freelance. Um, I did the program in end of November. Two, end of 2017. 2017, right, yeah. That suddenly seems impossibly long ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was the first person to do it in New York, so um, I had a different experience for him. We spoke before I did it, but it was obviously a different, <laughs> a different studio, a different system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you set the bar. But it was interesting seeing the Menlo Park shot that was so different from where I was. I'm Eddie Perrot, and I'm primarily an illustrator, and I did the program in 2016, so three years ago now. It's very really crazy. Um, yeah, I do freelance illustration. I live in Brooklyn and have a studio and stuff, so that's what I do. <laughs> um, I'm Louisa Dale. I am a graphic designer here in Brooklyn. I work independently. I did the program last year. I think it was the last one that did it in New York. You wrapped up last year? Yeah. Yep. And um, I'm now working at a studio in Brooklyn called Other Means, um, and I also edit and design the magazine Clog. Well, I mean, I guess the place to start with this is maybe just because we, I don't think any of us have actually really ever talked about this. It's just like when, whether it was me, I think in a lot of cases, or, or Justine had reached out and said, hey, do you want to do this? What was your first thought? <laughs> Whoever wants to take it. <laughs> I, I guess um, I was surprised. Well, I didn't really know what it was, and I didn't know that much about the lab. Um, and I, what really struck me was uh, we Skyped, and I had just applied for something else that was like this whole big process and all this work and all this back and forth, and it didn't happen. And I Skyped with Scott, and he was like, so when do you want to come? <laughs> and I was, you know, I was like, do I have to send you anything? Do I have to, you know, and it was just sort of like, no, just, you know, are you up for it? And so, um, yeah, it was, that was really a surprise and definitely, I think, got a sense of like, yeah, it's a casual <laughs> atmosphere. So um, it was really, really exciting. I didn't think it was something that would be an opportunity for me. So I was just like so pumped to do it. We were pumped to have you. <laughs> I guess because I did it a little later, like I knew a little bit about the program and knew a couple people who'd done it. Um, and I knew Jez who worked there mm -hmm. for ages. Um, so I knew about it, but didn't know there was a New York edition because there wasn't <laughs> until I started, I guess. Um, well, it's, been, it's been there for actually the a long lab, time, but the it lab was. has been there. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I um, kind of knew about it. I was definitely surprised like I was like how how did you find me what <laughs> why are you contacting me kind of because I'm not really a, I'm not a graphic designer um I don't really make posters or do anything with typography um and I don't um I don't know I didn't feel like I, my work was necessarily commercial enough to fit in with like something that was like a mass communication um like imagery that is what I'd seen coming out of the lab before so um Justine definitely like had to kind of talk me into it a little bit, and I was like, "Are you sure? <laughs> Why? What do you think I'm gonna make?" <laughs> um, but yeah, it was exciting to have the opportunity to have like six weeks um, to kind of play um, with um, not a ton of um, like structure, structured briefs or like um, 
there weren't like targets to hit like you normally have on a long project. So it was kind of it was an exciting um, opportunity. Yeah, I think similarly, like once I found out what it was, I was like really stoked and definitely very down to do it. So it was just like a really good opportunity to make a bunch of really cool stuff that was, you know, existed within like sort of like a closed environment, but you could kind of play around with like a lot of different materials and like a lot of resources and stuff that was really cool. Yeah. I actually knew about it because I had come before to teach a zine making class, which I think I don't know if I came in late to your talk, but I don't know if you also talked about the other classes that the lab does. And I think I alluded to it a little bit, but not right. specifically. Right. Yeah. So there, I was familiar with the structure of every once in a while for Facebook employees, them having classes that are about zine making or poster making or Rezo one-on-one um, -on -one kind of like teaching moments, which is really great. And basically any employee that has the training is allowed to come in and use the Rezo. So, I was also kind of interested in doing my residency in these classes, and I still come back to the lab to teach a poster making class, so it's kind of like a nice extension. But yeah, that's how I knew about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. I mean, more and more now we're able to bring back some of the people that we've had through the program in different ways. You know, in the case where you've got somebody local, if, if they're interested in teaching the class, we can actually you know, bring people back, and you know, they can do it kind of as much or as little as they want to, really. And you, you'd also done a residency prior, which is, that's the one kind of interesting thing we've been able to do um, where we can open up the lab to somebody sort of externally where they, you come in, you can sort of work on a project. Uh, we get to keep, you know, some small percentage of, but the rest is basically for you to take and kind of do whatever you want. It's, it's a really kind of nice, simple, and sort of low effort on our part uh, kind of way to, to open it up to uh, a wider audience and, than just the employees. So let's, let's talk intellectual stuff, because <laughs> why not? Uh, you know, have, having gone through this and just, I think, you know, even more so than the residency itself, is just like, in your practice, you know, how do you think design can, can influence culture? And how do you, through your practice, try to have some, you know, make some little kind of dent? Uh, in the world. You can start. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess like a lot of the way that I work personally is like pretty internal. Like it's just like reflecting on different stuff that I, different things that I like view and stuff like that. So like working in the Facebook lab and like working in like the campus and stuff, it was kind of just, I don't know, reflecting on like how busy everybody was and like what like kind of projects everybody else is working on. And it's like, you know, even though we're like just screen printing a bunch of posters and working with our hands and stuff, it's still, yeah, it's like a major part of this organization or whatever. Do you think there was any part of what you were doing that really, you were trying to speak to anybody there in a, in a particular way? You know, I mean, the, the, the biggest, you know, the piece that we've talked about this like kind of briefly, but just, that has always stuck with me is actually like this one that you made. Yeah. You know, this is this has been something that uh, has has been around now for three years and and continues to this day to just be something that's kind of heartwarming and uh, I, guess, I look at it very you know proudly knowing that like you did this and it's it's a really cool poster. I guess kind of just like trying to think about like community and at the time it was like uh, everything was as like a slightly less divided than it is now, but like it was still pretty, it was like starting to get pretty crazy in America at the time. So like, I think that it was like thinking about like how people find like a place of home or something or like feel accepted and stuff. Yeah. Do you remember what happened? I'm trying to remember the story of like how we decided to actually cut the corners off the, the top. I don't know. I think I just wanted to make it like a house. <laughs> Pretty basic. <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. Um, you were first asking about like work in general, but then, um, like I, some of my work is kind of is communication based. Like I do some narrative work, trying to communicate stories and things, and I feel like that. Um, I definitely tried to apply um, when I was at Facebook too, and so my residency being in twenty seventeen was post November 2016, so it definitely was like a 
tangibly weirder environment to be <laughs> existing, but also to be going into this company that you know had received some negative press, um, and that the lab obviously was pretty removed from kind of the machine itself, like what the company does, but everyone in the lab is connected to and working in this company in a way that, like I was pretty anxious going into the program thinking like, I have no idea what this office is gonna be like, what these employees are gonna be like, what they'll think about someone who's like sitting and drawing all day or how that interaction is gonna happen. Um, and I definitely went in wanting to find ways to relate to people that kind of wasn't about Facebook. Um, because fundamentally, like, the people going to work, and I'm also kind of a technophobe, and like, <laughs> I'm not not able to talk to them about what they do for their jobs. So I tried to communicate. Um, like, I did a project about um, what people found valuable, um, like non financially valuable, um, which was partly a reaction to everything is free in the office, and um, it's a very weird thing when everything is free. And at first, you're like, oh my god, I can take a hundred million snacks, and then you're like. I guess I'm gonna throw some of these away because I don't like, th and then like things become valueless when they're free in a way that I felt pretty uncomfortable about. Um, and I, yeah, so I reached out to employees. I sent a postcard to every employee in the company um, asking them to describe something that they found valuable and I, and tell me the story of it. And people were really, um, like shared really intimate details about their lives that were all kind of universal, you know, stuff to do with their families or something their child had made or something their grandmother had made. And I definitely like hung on to that as a way to feel grounded in an office environment that I'm not used to, a company that I don't understand. Like a, it was very different from working in a studio being an illustrator, you know? So yeah, that was like a, a way to reach out to the audience, the captive audience there kind of. And you've, you've got, I think there were more stories that you didn't even get to beyond the ones that ended up in the book. Yeah, so from the time I was there, I collected something, um, I think there were something like 40 um, that I illustrated and made into a book. And then from that, um, the book itself was given out for free to employees. But in order to make them value it, <laughs> they had to trade. Um, a valuable object of their own. So it wasn't just another freebie that you then put in the recycling. Um, they, everyone who wanted a copy had to draw and describe a valuable object of themselves. And it, it's still going. And the, mm -hmm. um, I saw a photo the other day. Um, there's still like a, a pile um, of books that you can take and a little display of the drawings that people are still adding to, which feels nice. So that's like a little pause in someone's yeah. day. Even even the, uh, the support report book, which is also over there, which had uh, a belly band wrapped around it with a little card, detachable card on the back that's like to get this book, you have to fill in this card and pledge support for something. That book came out in 2016. I actually just got uh, one of those cards in the mail from somebody like two weeks ago. <laughs> and we, we long finished with those. We actually turned all of the cards into an installation uh, in the end. So it's actually uh, takes over a giant conference room. Uh, we blew them up to about four times the size. and. Uh, and printed basically big wallpaper of it. You know, and I think like with your project, like anything that, like you were saying, of just like finding a way to add value to it so that people understand that it's not just another free thing yeah, is, 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 is pretty important. Yeah, and especially like the office is a pretty overwhelmingly saturated environment. Like everything's covered in murals and posters and stuff everywhere. And like to have a little moment to pause felt important for me, and therefore I assumed also probably it was for other people too. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I can do too. Well, at first, that's such a cool project. I didn't, I didn't know like the extent of that project. So, I mean, I think that's a perfect example of, yeah, how design can connect people. And um, I think design can be really powerful. I think it can move the needle on certain things I also struggle with, you know, uh, design is not the answer to everything, and I, as designers, uh, I think we often go to that because it's what we know. But sometimes, you know, just time and showing up is is just as important as, or more important as making something. Um, in my own practice, I'm working on uh, an issue of gratuitous type, um, a good ideas issue that's about you know people making socially engaged work, but also 
how we can do better in the way we work, not just like what we make. So I'm, I'm struggling with that. Um, I was at Facebook at a really weird time, which was during the election. So I had like a really happy life. Up to, I, I got there in October, like October 1st or something like that. I had a really happy life up till November where I was making posters that were like, relax, like slow down. And I was having like the time of my life and then the election happened and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? And I, like, I think I really just spent two weeks like wandering around the campus. We had, I remember we had a meeting that was like, here are like some ideas I had. I think I basically, to be honest, I mean, this is sort of like a, a failure, I, I think looking back, but I made like, a, I had like a million ideas and I nothing really came of it. I, I really struggled. Um, but some, I mean, it was very interesting to be there and very illuminating. Um, seeing like the internal conversations. There's like, there's Facebook for Facebook that you get access to when you work at Facebook and you see all these teams talking about the election and everything going on. And they're really, really interesting conversations. And, and some of those, I thought I had to make these posters that were like, it's all your fault, Facebook. And I realized obviously like everyone was way ahead of me and were already like fixing things. And so I felt a little bit useless at that time, but I mean, it was really a good, it was a, a bad wake-up call but I mean it was a it was an important moment for me I don't know that I rose to the occasion but um, I think about it a lot I think you did I always you know I always look back at when you, you and Jimmy were there and being particularly prolific between the two of you I definitely like cried a lot <laughs> well we don't want that unless it's from, you know, tears of joy or laughter at least <laughs> I think that is really interesting to hear that about like your personal experience to it. And I think that that's what taught me the most about the residency is just spending time by myself, forcing me to do work. And there's all I had, I put a lot of pressure on myself to make something every week. So I would have these small weekly projects and then these like bi-weekly projects. And I would in the beginning struggle a lot with the amount of time and uh, results or something. And then through time, I was like, that's okay. You know, I made nine things, eight are awful. One is okay, you know? Or, and then it, it was much kind of like a selfish uh, process, but I'm very thankful for that I got to spend there because then I, I allowed myself to iterate endlessly and then have good ideas. And I feel like at the six week mark is when you're having these good ideas and then it's kind of over. But that's the point, right? Is that this, it's, it's a process. I mean, I think all of you in your own ways were actually very prolific in the things that you were making. I mean, Eddie, you made tons of zines and, and Rizzo prints and a bunch of screen prints and same with Alana, like, there's two, two of your screen prints are up here, one with a big hole in it, <laughs> unfortunately. I had to rip it off the walls of the New York office to bring it here, because <laughs> we didn't have any more, apparently. Um, they're such a pain in the ass to print, they'll like, mm -hmm. print it again. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> um, you know, and, and same with Kay, like, you were doing a, like, I guess it was weekly project, the, the, what became the newspaper? It was a daily newspaper. Was it, it was daily? Yeah. Was it only over like the course of a week or two weeks or something? Um, I don't think I thought of it for the first week. No, oh, okay. And then I was there over Thanksgiving and stuff, but it was pretty much, it was every day. Right. And that was like, was kind of my initial um, coping with extreme alien environment that I didn't understand. Um, like, I've never worked in an office at all before, let alone a gigantic office of like one of the biggest companies in the world. So it was a pretty intense culture shock. Um, and. Almost everything I saw, I was like, if I hadn't signed an NDA, I'd be texting all my friends right now to be like, can you believe what's over there? <laughs> like, so I made a newspaper every day of like, I can't believe what I just saw. Look at this thing. Guess how many snacks I ate today? Like, everything that seemed notable that was like, intending to make fun of myself, that I'm like, wide-eyed, like, oh my god, there's like a giant minion doll in the office, but also trying to make fun of the office a little, Gently, I didn't want to get in trouble, but like, um, I felt like like quite a lot of the conversations and the attitude there was like people weren't noticing the space they were in because I'm sure once you've worked there more than two months, you're like, yeah, there's just another like giant box of donuts or like a huge mural, or, like some famous dude is walking through here, and I'm like, so it was useful to like try and point out and be like, hey, notice the weird place you're in, notice how this works this way here. And, probably doesn't somewhere else. And um, 
I definitely thought I would rapidly be told to not do it. Because I like I mean, it's bad. I didn't read the small print of the NDA. I don't know what violates NDA. Well, I think the first the first one was like I filmed a karaoke performance. They had like happy hour with karaoke, and as I was filming it, I was like, I bet this violates my NDA. <laughs> and that was like the first headline was like, does filming karaoke performance violate NDA? I think it does it. But I don't think so. In the sense, like um, you said something about um, the Black Lives Matter poster and like slightly pushing to see what you could get away with, or, like what you'd be allowed to do. And I was definitely curious with whether, I mean, I say the company, it's not like I was like sending stuff to Zuck, <laughs> but like whether I would be allowed to gently make fun of things or to point out like this is a pretty weird thing that's going on. Um, and I only got in trouble once. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that, that zine is one of my fav most favorite things. It's. I find it hilarious. I'm glad. And it it's, it's over there. If anybody wants to see how ridiculous it can be to be inside a Facebook You can also see what I meant when I said I don't do typography. It's just my handwriting. But that's, that's the best part about it, I think. It's just that it's like there's, there's only really limited words, but the words you chose and the things you chose to sort of pull apart and point out is, is like really incredibly poignant. Oh, thank you. It was also, it was a good, it was kind of like a, um, like a homing signal for like people who I would get along with. Like I was like, the people who respond to this probably will be my friends here, you know? <laughs> so like it's laid out in the lab and people come by to pick up free posters and they're like, what's this? Um, and some of them were like, I like this. And then <laughs> now they're my friends. <laughs> Actually, one of them is now my boyfriend. I don't know if you know that. I did not know that. Well, there we go. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the the NDA. I mean, because I think that like plays into your sort of big final project. Which... I'm like keeping quiet. In no, 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 no. You know, it's it's. I broke the rules. You didn't break the rules at all. But it was it was one of those things where I mean, we had some conversations, just like, you know, it was a little bit uncomfortable, like, but in a, in a good way, of course. You know, and actually, why don't you tell Should everybody? Tell, it, yeah. tell everybody what you Speaking, did. It, no microphone is cool. <coughs> I um, I wanted to for, for my the there's kind of some structure in the program where for the first week you kind of are expected to do a small project and then throughout a project and at the end it kind of culminates into this final project and then for me I did this installation where I printed out Facebook's uh, terms of service. Um, really big into 24 by 36 posters and that made for a big stack of posters and it was kind of like as you took them away um, you were only reading it kind of like paragraph at a time and they were broken it broken up in weird places and um, we and it was really delicate like it was a really hard conversation and there was debates on whether we should do it or we shouldn't do it and there's obviously and I had never read this in terms of service and like no one that was in the conversation had it seemed like and so my intention with it is kind show of show of hands anybody has read them <laughs> so my intention of it is to kind of um, you know uh, bring light to these kind of like foggy pieces of information and if you think about it the only thing that all of us in that building had in common is that we pressed yes to this and we don't even know what's in it so it was this kind of like typographical exploration of the posters and you can take them away um, but it was a, it was a bit of a process but I'm happy that I was kind of critical of my position, you know, and my privilege being there to kind of speak to the to Facebook. I think it was it's I'm really glad that we actually, you know, ended up doing it. You know, I think it's uh, you know, nobody's reacted negatively to it. I'm sure, you know, we were afraid for no particular reason really, you know, but it but it again, like Kay had done with the zine is sort of pointing at these things that people take for granted. I think the more you can point out these things that are either really important that we just sort of blindly accept or that we kind of gloss over um, just because we're not really paying attention uh, are really important. And I think everybody here has done that in some way through, through the projects that you guys made. So is there any, how are we doing on time here? We're almost at time, I think. Uh, is there anything that I think you know, you think really surprised you from the residency? Like anything that you really didn't expect, or like something that uh, you were working on that sort of came out in a really different form than maybe where it started? I need to hold this to talk. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll project. <laughs> um, oh, am I? Is everyone looking at me? We're going to go back uh, to you, Alana. Okay. <laughs> um, well, the election was a surprise, uh, but that didn't have anything to do with me. Um, I guess some of the process stuff, like, I, as much as, uh, pr like, production is really important in my work, and I'm really interested in it, um, you know, when you actually get to touch it and be a part of it, it really draw, like, can help drive where things go, so I did, like, a series of posters that, um, sort of ended up in a really different place than where they started, just by the nature of, sort of, like, working with screen printing and talking with the printers and Scott and um, just like seeing how far I could push some of those things. So, I mean, that was surprising. And also, I guess, just like my uh, ability to do those kinds of things, like it, I, I learned I could do that. I mean, I've, I've like dipped into things, um, but I always, I've always thought of myself as someone that's not very good at the sort of like technical printing things. Um, and so I, I realized, like, I am good at this. I can do this. And so there was, like, a, a lot of, like, empowering things came out of it, just about how I could work, how fast I could work. Um, the, all that, like, really I, was really formative for me. Anybody else? Um, I definitely, I was surprised by how um, my work was affected being in that environment, that, like, when I first got got the residency, I was thinking, okay, it's six weeks to kind of do whatever I want, I'm going to make stuff. Like, I never normally do. I'll do a huge thing with all these resources. And I kind of, um, I definitely found it, like, hard to concentrate for prolonged periods of time, because the lab is open to all the staff can come and use it to make things, which is a nice way to meet people, but not great when you, like, have to really focus for more than two hours at a time. So I definitely, I had expected to do some grand conceptual <laughs> thing that was like one prolonged project kind of and I instead was like working in these little snippets and snatches so actually things like making a quick thing every day or the book where I could illustrate like one or two people's stories a day kind of was how I was able to divide at the time and I was that kind of is what my work is like anyway and I was sort of surprised to be like oh I'm kind of the same person wherever I am <laughs> like in a in a way that is sort of nice. Also, sort of, I was like, oh. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't just constantly think, like, if only I could change this one thing, everything would be different. But it was, yeah, it was interesting to look back and think, like, what I thought I was going to do and be going in, and what I was coming out, and that it kind of, it definitely made me, I don't know, realize this is the kind of work that I, I'm comfortable making. I can make when I feel uncomfortable, or like I'm not able to focus on a reinventing myself. This is like what's there at the core, kind of. Maybe for the other two, what was the most uncomfortable part? Or like, what was the thing that sort of felt like it put you the most on edge yourself in, in, in your, not necessarily like personally or anything, but like in, in your practice and sort of how you would normally go about doing anything? You know, what, was there something that pushed you in a particular direction that was new or different? I think having all the people around, like you said. It's like a lot of like interruptions, but at the same time, then you kind of like figure out how to work faster and like work in like smaller breaks than it is. Like if you have like a super involved project that's like you're super deep in your space and like in your own like comfort zone. So it's like, yeah, like having people there like looking at what you're doing all the time and kind of like picking through it and stuff is like, different, for sure. <laughs> is that a good thing, sometimes? Yeah, I think it's a good thing. It makes you, like, think about what you have sitting around, and, like, what's, like, like, more, like, conscious of what you're working on at any given moment or something. Not sure. I guess there weren't, maybe the month I was there, there weren't that many people all the time, so. At the end of the year, so yeah, end it's of a little quieter. Yeah, yeah, so I was able to focus. I think my uh, struggles were kind of, like, with myself, I think, um, and just trying to push it, and then the result would jam, and, and you know, it's like final hour, and, and things are not working. Um, but overall, really, really nice experience. Yeah. Can I Does everybody have a Rezo jam story? I'm sure all four of you must have one. No, well, what I was going to add was I was just surprised not to be like too Facebook 
gushy, but I felt like I was at camp, like in the best way, <laughs> which is everyone was so nice, and you're thrown in with these other artists you don't know who, who make really different work from you, and you're surrounded by amazing work, and it's like very intimidating, um, but just like the experience of just being thrown in with all these people was really special, and I think about those people all the time. Um, like that, it surprised me like how much I sort of loved all the people in the lab. It was weird. <laughs> was there any? I mean, we do kind of throw people to the wolves a little bit when you come in, like, and probably more so even than than it's been at certain times in the past. Where like we've tried sort of the loose project brief kind of thing, where it's like, here's a broad topic. Like, what would you make based on on this? Just knowing themes of things that are going on kind of within the company, so you don't necessarily have to come in completely cold and go like, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, versus just working on your own, like, what is better, do you think, for you personally, like, in how you like to work? You know, or how do you, you know, how do you think about yourself? You know, is it more of the artist mentality or more of a designer mentality where it's like, I think artists tend to sort of find a problem and work towards different ways of solving it versus a designer who tends to sort of give me a problem and I'll give you a solution. I, I well, I feel like I'm a designer till someone says they don't like it and then I'm an artist. I'm happy to change. But uh, I mean, I, I, you gave, I got some briefs and I almost like, I even struggled with the broadness of the brief, so it, but it was like, uh, it kind of went both ways, like sometimes I felt, I think I was just overwhelmed by everything that I could do, I mean it's like, you can screen print, this is a laser cutter, this is a wood shop, like I want to do absolutely everything in like three months, and like the ticking clock was sort of this like, my enemy, um, so, but I, I think having, having some direction for me was important, I don't, I don't think of myself as an artist, so um, I, I liked being guided a little bit, personally. I sort of think of Eddie you being more leaning towards the artist side in a way. Yeah, I but just agree that like I'm just gonna be the same like wherever you put me. I'm just gonna like keep doing the same stuff. <laughs> so it was nice to have it broad, but it was like definitely super overwhelming with like how many things you could do and like it was crazy. Yeah, I mean you're you're one of my sort of perfect examples of like somebody who would make things and uh, do things in a way that I can't do or wouldn't would never do. And I think that's, you know, uh, between all four of you really, like, is what brings something kind of special into the company. It's like, you're going to get these other sort of experiences uh, and other ways of making things that will potentially spark something else. I mean, you know, seeing the way you work made me want to play around with doing things like that. And same with like, hey, you're, you're sort of, uh, is it watercolor? Or, or uh, not watercolor, but uh, like ink. Uh, Sumi ink yeah. kind of drawings like makes me like oh, that looks like a lot of fun and like really kind of soothing and you know and, and Louisa just the way you will go and work with type in a way again like this sort of you know, I think your process is probably very different than than how I would work and same with you I mean you're you're kind of a jack of all trades and think in my in my eyes and, and the, <laughs> you know I've I've you know obviously like we've known each other for a while now and like I knew about your work before which is I think part of what made it so easy <laughs> we should totally bring her in um, but you, you just sort of can do it all I guess is, is what I'm saying or at least that's that's what it seems like to me I mean, just like the, um, the, like I mean, everyone here. It's just, there are just so many good people, and I just, I just felt like talk about like Lita's poster, doubt your doubts. I was like, why did they pick me? <laughs> I don't know. So thanks. <laughs> well, why don't we take a couple minutes and see if anybody out here has a question? Anybody? Come on the back. You talked about. Uh, kind of this bottom-up idea generation, maybe this is pushing stuff into the company and out into the world. Any sense of the impact? And I don't mean like metrics, I just mean like more impressions of that happened, that changed. Uh, there's definitely things that I think we know when something clicks, you know. Uh, exactly what the impact is is sometimes kind of hard to know. I think, uh, you know, or it, or it's if it's hard to know, it's often hard to know because it takes a while for you to see the results of it. 
It's not just like, we did something and then something happened and you, you know that something happened. It usually takes quite a while before it really sinks in. Um, you know, I think, I know, you know, there's been some talk of like, this idea of like, slow down, you know, um, being something that, at a company that moves really quickly, getting people to slow down is, is like, really hard, um, because it's just not in the, kind of in the DNA of the company. But, it, and it's funny because people intrinsically know that actually they do. They, they need to slow down, they need to take a vacation, they need to, you know, stop working for an hour and, and take a break and have lunch or go for a coffee or something. Um, and we, we see it in little, in little pockets where there's things that have happened since this that to me in some way tells me that whether it was this exactly that sparked somebody having a conversation going like, maybe the effect on people is actually not so good. And so what can we do to help kind of counteract that? You know, I feel like in the case of this, like we were at, uh, at the forefront of, of really like reminding people that like work is not everything and you can't just burn yourself out. It's not, it's not good. It definitely, it feels like the lab is more for the, the people than like the product or like the meta company. Like, I don't know if there's a hope or any, like if you're thinking the posters will like have an effect on the product in the end, but it's more, it seemed more when I was there at least, it was kind of, um, it was like a break for employees that they could come and do something different. It's like, it's more there for individuals, or it felt like it, and that similarly the work we were making would be more likely to affect like the yeah. mental health or day-to-day -day of the individuals working there, um, rather than trying to then change what they're actually making, but I suppose there inherently is a connection between if you're really unhappy you're going to make different stuff, but it, it felt, when I was there at least, like most of how we talked about the work we were making was about the impact it would have on like the local, the people around mm -hmm. who were, like we weren't talking a ton about like how is this gonna travel up the chain. Yeah, I think that's just, it's not. I don't mean that as a criticism. No, no, no. Like, that I, seemed like the goal. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, we, we still don't necessarily talk about that really directly. I mean, I think it's, the work is there to influence the people who make these things in some small way, you know, and it's like, these are like micro, kind of uh, things that happen within you know, one person or uh, small groups of people. And it can be kind of a viral thing where it starts to take off and you start to see like you know, little mini movements happening around something. But there's not a big expectation like, we're going to put up a poster and it's going to fix everything. Like that's just, that's just not going to happen. Uh, and if it did, well, then somebody deserves a raise. <laughs> Do you ever intentionally take um, inspiration or look up like early tech companies that had similar artist in residency programs or internal printing companies? I know like Bell Labs had a similar kind of program back in the sixties, but I'm curious if you ever intentionally modeled this after that or just happened to come up with a similar thing. I think it just happened naturally, really. I mean we definitely know about Bell Labs and there's lots of big organizations that have art programs. Um, but most of them from my understanding is it's some execs admin person who buys art to hang on the walls. <laughs> and that's sort of really where it ends. You know, the way things work at Facebook, it's really different. Like there is this very big established program to work with local artists and designers to bring them in to create sort of, you know, uh, economic opportunity for them, but also an opportunity to push themselves and to do something kind of different. Uh, and we hope that's we hope that's a valuable thing, you know. And that's in keeping, I think, with where Bell Labs and even IBM, I think, at one point uh, has had similar kinds of programs. Yeah, it's not you know nobody nobody here is going to claim that like we invented this because we didn't. It also seems like there's interesting competition now between the tech companies, like. Who has the better, crazier, creative space? I have a friend that works at Airbnb, and he was like, well, at Airbnb, we got a foil stamper. And I, I don't know, there was like, people were like sharing what they had at their thing. And so I don't know, it's, it's interesting uh, kind of trend right now, but um, yeah. 
we know a little bit about like who has what, but it's, <laughs> it's not a competition. Not for Facebook, maybe, but for those other yeah. ones, I think. <laughs> it's nice actually because like there's a lot of the people that at, at some of those other companies that like we're friends with, and so like actually somebody the other day, actually Everett, messaged me the other day going like I have this problem with the Rezo. Like, has anybody else been dealing with this? What do you think I should do? You know, and so we can all help each other. You know, and I think that's that's really kind of neat. That's, uh, this this you didn't sort of weird it? thing. No, 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 no. I would I would never do that. With the wrong ink in the wrong drum. Well, thankfully the machine is smart enough to not let you do anything. Oh. <laughs> or dumb enough. I don't know which one it is. Anybody else? All right. Well. We'll call that. We'll call that that. Now, there's uh, hopefully everybody. Did everybody get a raffle ticket? Uh, eight two six three eight zero. Wow. Three eight zero. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, I guess we should check that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.